Oh, one of, the, one of the greatest places in Uptown. It just looks really frickin' cool. Pretty much everybody's heard of Mother Murphy's. I don't know if they've been in it, but they've heard of it. This place, seriously, it was like I walked in 15 years ago. The same feeling, same look, same everything. It, it's just a great place to go to. It's like stepping back in time. There's just something about this place. <laughs> You know, I'd hate to see it just disappear. Welcome to Mother Murphy's. My name's Michael Williams, and uh, my wife and I, Becky, bought the business in 1990 and have enjoyed running it and being part of the community all these years. I was born here in Bloomington Normal, so, uh, and in 1968 the store opened. I was kind of aware of it because I lived just a few blocks away from it, but I would have been only probably 12, 12 years old, 13 years old at the time. And I remember just going by the front of the store and I didn't go in, you know, but it was so bright and colorful and the signage was so psychedelic or interesting to me, you know, and I, I kind of wanted to go in, but I didn't, I felt like it was an older person store or something. Started shopping here much more, probably in 78, I was living out here in Normal, and I got to know Betty and Charlotte, the owners, the originators, and uh, eventually got a job here in late 79. You know, they opened it when they, I don't know if they were in their 40s or 50s, but the whole idea was Mother Murphy's, they were a little bit older, was, Betty Anderson and Charlotte Radka, but Charlotte's maiden name was Murphy, so they came up with the Mother Murphy's name for the store, but uh, they were partners in it. So I worked with Betty and Charlotte, but uh, at that time, it was a much smaller store. It was full of bongs and pipes. Parts of the store were full of jewelry and leather goods. After hanging out here for a couple years and hanging out with all the students and partying with the students and stuff like that, I decided, well, maybe, maybe I could go back to school and go to college when I was in my mid-20s. And I did. I went to school for eight years and uh, got my degree in 1989. And they uh, had bought a house out in Arizona and wanted to retire out there. So in 1985, they sold it to the then landlord, uh, Cup Chang. And he called me in, and before he bought it, asked me, would I want to stay and run it for him. Then after I graduated from college in 89, I started uh, applying for jobs around town, state farm, you know, country companies, the obvious choices, this and that. And uh, it looked like I was probably gonna get hired on by state farm. I was taking a tour of the building and meeting higher ups and stuff like that as part of the interview process. And it was about that time that Cup said, would you like to buy the business? And Becky and I decided, you know, it would be a good move for us. But once Becky and I bought it, it was like I wanted to be real gung-ho and, you know, get out there and advertise and do all this stuff. And I think a lot of our efforts paid off because we did see sales go up by putting a lot of money in advertising and things like that that the previous owner had not done, you know. So, like I said, we did a lot of things right there at the beginning. I don't know if it had to do with signage or the advertising we did on TV or getting the word on the streets. I'm not quite sure what we did right, but we did something right. And we became increasingly more successful. You know, we're not trying to have every all our eggs in one basket. And I think that's been partly successful to be resilient and adapt as the times around you change, the city around you change, society changes, you know, to be able to adapt like that. Uh, we've been lucky, you know, and I know it. 10, 12 years ago, they went through a huge renovation for the whole area. It's a lot prettier than it used to be, but the parking is terrible. At first, I, I hated it. You know, they tore down a lot of buildings, whatever. But, you know, business is better. There's a lot more people down here. The, the town has done an amazing job at kind of reinventing this entire area. Um, there's been some construction and, you know, while it was kind of hard to get through, the we've, uh, I mean, everyone down here has kind of reaped the benefits of it, so. And they didn't run off all the small stores, you know. So that's a good thing. It's a good mixture downtown. If it's all strip malls and uh, McDonald's, then we already have plenty of that all over America. Now there's shops popping up everywhere, it seems like. At gas station sound pipes. You know, you can buy these things almost anywhere. I used to about a in the 
80s, there was a big push by government to close all hippie head shops, smoke shops, bong shops, and there was a lot of people getting prosecuted. And they were successful. They closed most of them. And most people were afraid to get into the business. You know, it was a big barrier for anybody to get into the business. Well, I better have a good lawyer if I'm gonna do that. You know, store would open, maybe have records and posters and stuff, throw some pipes on the shelf. Next thing you know, a policeman's visiting. So you get rid of that or we're gonna come after you. And it's, uh, just pull it as opposed to, you know, having them come after them. There was a time period when we were getting customers from Peoria, Champaign, as far as St. Louis and Chicago, because there were no stores like this. They, they came for us too. We went to court a couple times. We had good legal representation. I never really had to set and in, go into court. My lawyer was able to poke holes in whatever they were trying to do to me at the time. Becky wanted to get into a business, and as I was saying before, we were trying to figure out a void to maybe open a second store. And so that's when we decided to open Shockwaves in 1992. And it was pretty much Becky running Shockwaves in Bloomington while I continued to run Mother Murphy's in Normal. So the Shockwaves was a, a huge success as well for many years, probably a decade, um, before we started to probably taper off a little bit, you know? And that's when we, probably after 13 years or so, we put both stores together to help them both survive, both entities sort of survive. So many of our employees, I think, were past customers, and oftentimes they were hired because of their strengths. I've been skating since I was about 11 or 10. Ever since it's been here, uh, I was a customer, and uh, whenever there was the opportunity for a job, I guess I seemed like an obvious candidate. Yeah, I've worked here for about five or six years, and then I've uh, been the manager of the skate shop for maybe three or four of those years. To get the job uh, for Mother Murphy's, typically even, you have to uh, not just know a little bit about skateboard, but kind of actively skateboard. It's kind of a strange thing where you work at both places, you know what I mean? And while there's a lot of people that have the knowledge to work at Mother Murphy's, you also have to have the knowledge to work at Shockwaves. In general, my best memories are just, honestly, you know, sitting around here talking to either customers or my bosses or, you know, whoever's up here about music or skateboarding or whatever it is. Through the course of being, you know, running the store and stuff like that, I've been in bands my whole life. It's, it's been, you know, a joy for me. And I've performed at different benefits. I mean, I'd always have reefer songs to play, you know. I'd learn new songs, whether they were from the 1930s or stuff that I'd written. And I was lucky enough to find guys that were willing to join a band. I, I'd been in bands, mostly cover bands, you know, and I might say, hey, I wrote a song. But no, we're playing covers over here. You know, and finally I got some people together, close friends and family, and I want to play my songs, you know, and was able to get out there and perform around town in a couple of groups over the years that uh, we did my originals. Some of the cover bands I was in was Smokey Jones and the Mellow Tones. That was kind of a jazzy band. Then there was Static Attic, which was all garage rock. My own bands were the Swingin' Hemp Hills. And we put out, we worked together for probably 11 years or something in the 90s and recorded two CDs. And then more recently in 2011, I got with a few guys and we had a band called uh, The Mighty Murph Tones. Imagine that. We played around town quite a bit and we put out a CD in 2016. So I've been in and out of bands my whole life and I've been writing songs my whole life and I still continue to do that. It's just something maybe more therapeutic than anything else. We're getting older and thinking about retiring, you know, and we'd hate to liquidate, as anybody that owned a business would hate to liquidate, you know, you'd much rather find somebody to carry on the venture. First of all, I would just wish the best for both of them. I hope that, uh, you know, whatever choices they make, they're happy. That's all that really matters. I, I don't think closing is a good idea. 
you know, they'll let, let the next guy go. I hope it continues, the new owner would be great. But I mean, everything ends sometime. I'd be really sad. I like it in there. I want to be able to go back. I would hope they'd sell it to somebody, uh, you know, coming up, uh, somebody hopefully millennial or even younger. For the business itself, you know, if it could con continue on with new uh, ownership or management, that would be nice. The town's had, of, had them there this long. It'd be nice to keep them around. And then uh, as long as it's around someday, you know, maybe someday I could pick it up, but that's, uh, that's their retirement plan, and I don't think I have enough money to help them retire. <laughs> yeah, pass it on, Mike. You know, I, I guess the most important advice I would think about getting anybody that's getting into business would just uh, just try to be honest. You know, don't try to promise things that you can't provide. Listen to your customers and talk with your customers and learn what your customers are wanting. I'm, I'd miss being, being with all the customers all the time. You know, the camaraderie, that sort of thing, you know. Uh, the stories <laughs> that they all come in and tell me. You know, I'm, I feel like over the years I've been a sounding board, you know, the psychiatrist in for a nickel. You know, you can come in and tell me your troubles and I might have some advice. I might just be a, you know, a willing ear. You know, every generation has people that has shopped here in the past, whether it was for records or whether it was for skateboards or, you know, I mean, because we're so diverse, we have different little, I suppose, cliques of people, you know? I feel like my wife has raised, you know, a couple of generations of skaters. I think it's a, a, a real joy for both of us. My customers are so damn friendly, you know, I feel like a king wandering around up in here. It's been a blessing, a joy. I'm not a religious person, but I sure feel blessed most of the time. <laughs>